Welcome, friends, to the How To Heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. And I'm Uncle Dan. And I am Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's right. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But it can be a scary world. Ah! Hmm, Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we're here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, we only get the one that we know of, so you better make the most of it. All right, so let's do version one. Fellas... Hey Hello. There. What uh what a beautiful a beautiful sunny day here for the three of us to be apart together. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it's a lovely day. Yeah. It, yes. it does help with it does help the spirit somewhat when Truly. the sun is out and the birds are chirping and the flowers are blooming. But that's not what we're going to talk about today, is it? No. N- never. Never no. that. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to start us off with a long and windy road, uh, a crazy crazy tale of um, forgeries and salamanders and bombs. It's really uh, a story about Mormons and penmanship. Yes. <laughs> right? And, yeah, the Mark Hoffman and, saga. They, they may they, have beautiful penmanship. They tend to have beautiful penmanship. They're very prideful that way. I am then going to uh, conduct an interview uh, with a author and journalist, uh, Jared Yates Sexton, uh, who has is writing a book kind of about the history of theocracy in America and uh, we're kind of fucked. So it's a, a very <laughs> fascinating interview, and we're actually going to do it in two parts. So yep. first half will be this week. Second half will be next week. I know you're going to want to, to listen into both because it is – I've been doing this a long time, and it is more cray-cray than even I thought it was. So that'll be yep. fun. There's a, there's a lot of cray out there. Yeah. To so be look, we're doing a two-parter today just because uh, there's some lengthy stuff that we got to cover. Yeah, yeah. So uh, enjoy that. And uh, without further ado, let us uh, do a show. Woohoo! Hey, Uncle Mark. Yeah. Uh, listen, when, when was the last time you had something really fun delivered to you? Uh, it's a daily event now with canned food <laughs> arriving in boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're all uh, basically anything that is good or bad in our lives is now brought directly to our doorsteps by yes. people who hopefully wash their hands a lot <laughs> and uh, bless the, and bless them. Bless them. Stay they are, safe. They are the uh, they are the people who keep the country running. Uh, but yes. Uncle Doug, I think you have some stories of some some maybe less joyful deliveries. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk today about it, some some packages that nobody really wanted. Were they um, delivered by Blamazon? <laughs> oh, my God. I stepped into Uncle Doug's job there, the stupid <laughs> puns, right? Is, is it, so is this sense of disgust, I feel, is that normal for you guys? That's what it's like for us every day. Basically, all, right, all no, the time. Okay. I'm going to lean into it. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if there's one through thread in our little podcast, if there's one theme that echoes through most, if not all of the episodes we have ever done, it is this, Mormons be cray. <laughs> this very weird religion born of one very weird dude mm. and carried through time and across a continent by an even by even weirder people has led to some strange stories indeed and a body count big <laughs> body count yes indeed it's sure. about to get a little bit bigger um one of those stories one of the strangest took place not at all far away from where we are all sitting and it took place when the three of us were actually alive that um, is true mm-hmm. in fact uh for most utahns of a certain age this story is burned into our memory but I'm going to wager that for nearly everyone else, this will be the first time they've heard the name Mark Hoffman. Mm. Uh, Mark Hoffman is known where he is known for two things, being almost certainly one of the most talented forgers in history and for going on a bombing spree in Salt Lake City in 1985 that terrified the state and still mystifies us today. Mm. <clears throat> Indeed, this story could not happen in another time and in another place. Uh, his litany of forgeries, the power structure that fell for them, are inextricably, inextricably tied to Mormon history in such a way that even many of our Exmo listeners are going to struggle to get the context. Most of the material I'm going to talk about today comes from Robert Lindsay's seminal book on this subject, A Gathering of Saints. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, but in reality, I am only scratching the surface. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you're interested in, in taking a deeper dive, I definitely recommend the book. It's a really good read. Um, this is a long and windy tale that requires a lot of context to make heads or tails. 
Uh, but let's start with the events that so shocked the sleepy and very conservative town of Salt Lake City in October of 1985. <clears throat> in the morning of the 15th, a businessman named Stephen Christensen arrived at his office at the Judge Building in downtown Salt Lake. He took an elevator up to the sixth floor where he found a package outside his office. He bent down to pick it up and it exploded, killing Christensen. Mm. Uncle Mark, we have a pretty weird connection to that office. Yeah, though. well, you know, Small Lake City is what it is. Like, it's, it is, a, <laughs> it is a, a small, big city. And uh, that very office where he, Christensen was killed is now the graphic design firm where my husband works. Yeah, crazy. And, and it is a beautiful, it's the judge buildings, it's beautiful old, uh, probably turn of the century, uh, six story office building in Salt Lake. And it has tile floors, and you can see that the tile floor there has been repaired. Interesting. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. pretty crazy. Uh, only a couple hours later on that same morning, a woman named Kathy Sheets had gone for a walk in a quiet neighborhood east of downtown. As she returned home, she found a package leaning against her garage door. When she picked it up, it exploded and it killed her. Mm. Uh, the two victims were linked through business, Kathy being the wife of Stephen's business partner. Uh, but there seemed to be no reason for their murders. Um, the city was paralyzed with fear. So the next day, when another bomb exploded in downtown Salt Lake, severely injuring a guy named Mark Hoffman, mm. the city went into lockdown. Um, and I, I don't know how well you guys remember that, but it was pretty freaking crazy. I was a junior in high school. I remember it with great clarity. And I remember that, you know, don't touch your mail. The mail delivery stopped. Yeah. They're like, don't touch anything in your mailbox. Don't touch anything on your front porch. I'm not even convinced I was. I, I might have been in preschool. I don't know really how old I was then, but I feel like I'm. I'm so much younger than Uncle Mark that I. I, I, I can't recall. <clears throat> he was in the pre-existence. <laughs> <laughs> well, even under that curtain of fear, the police soon determined that Mark Hoffman was their main suspect in the bombings, and that the spree might have been related to a series of high-profile documents touching on Mormon Church history. The story that unraveled over the next several months shocked the Mormon faith to its core and is still a considerable embarrassment to them today. Mm. Um, so let's jump to the beginning of the story. <clears throat> Mark William Hoffman was born here in Salt Lake in 1954 to a very devout Mormon family. The story of his early life is so familiar to anyone who hails from this part of the world as to be unremarkable. Um, and it does not seem to bear any many clues as to what was to come. He wasn't a great student, but he was a stellar Mormon boy, attending seminary and eventually going on a mission to Bristol, England. <clears throat> Somewhere along the way, though, he lost his faith and he became an atheist. This was a facet of himself that he would keep a secret from all those around him until he was a prisoner in the Utah State Penitentiary. He didn't tell anybody. He didn't tell. He to, he had a uh, almost got married once to a woman and the marriage fell apart and he apparently told her that he had no, no longer believed. But he uh, his father was extremely devout and so he never w was able to tell his father. So, no, he didn't mm -hmm. tell anybody. Uh, and not only did he not did he lose his faith, he became enraged with the absolutely dishonest and false official version of church history that he and all other Mormon children, including us, had been taught. Uh, this rage would lead him down a path to try and destroy the official version and the church itself. Uh, a talent that Mark, that Hoffman had that no one else knew about was he, he was pretty good at deceiving people and forging documents. As a kid, he had actually forged a, a D, a capital D, on an old dime. And, which fooled the Denver Mint into thinking it was more valuable than it actually was, and he earned some cash off that. He wait, he, <laughs> he he did metal forgery. Yeah, he did. He managed to 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 get a like uh, met, uh, you know the little D for the Denver Mint on a coin. Yeah. He forged that. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it's it gets crazier. He took up the hobby of coin collecting and document trading, and in 1980 decided to see how good he really was. Um, <clears throat> I mean, his kids in his mid twenties, right? And this is kind of the path he goes down. Um, in, in, in a local bookstore, Hoffman claimed to have found a Bible that appeared to be uh, the Smith family Bible, that is, Joseph Smith. Right. If that were not enough, he claimed that inside the Bible, folded up, was a document called the Anthon Transcript. Uh, transcript. Uh, little context. This was a piece of paper that Joseph Smith is said to have written several of the ancient glyphs from the golden plates so that his scribe and financier, a uh, financier, uh, Martin Harris, could, could have them evaluated. Harris, as gullible a man as there ever was, took this paper to a professor, Charles Anthon, at Columbia College in 1828. The professor uh, laughed Harris out of the room because the glyphs were nonsense. <laughs> However, Joseph turned this failure into a success by showing, a, showing Harris a scripture in Isaiah where it said that the learned shall not be able to understand or read a sealed book. Harris was totally fooled. 
And now Hoffman claimed to have this paper transcript in his possession. Uh, and what happened next is bananas. Barry Fell, who was a marine biologist, a linguist, a professor emeritus at Harvard, director of the National Decipherment Center, and president of the Epigraphic Society, fell for this, hoard- for this for, uh, forgery, hook, line, and pipe bomb. <laughs> he, he claimed that the strange markings, which Hoffman admitted later, were a hodgepodge of various ancient languages and even apparently some native Nova Scotian tossed in, Whoa. read the following, quote, Revelation of Nephi. I have written these things. Let me reiterate this. This is a scholar reading Mark Hoffman's forgery and coming up with something that, as we'll see, is extremely close to the Book of Mormon. Uh, is the guy, was the, the scholar a Mormon? No, he wasn't. And no one's to this day entirely certain why he did this and how he, he conflated. He must have obviously lifted this from the Book of Mormon. Um, but it was to everyone's ast- astonishment, including Hoffman. Um, it go, he goes on to quote, I, Nephi, a son born to sagacious parents in a series of 19 ancient alphabets have trans- trans- transcribed this. Zedekiah in Judah uh, had just begun his reign. My father, Lehi, was of Salem, the holy city sacred. Um, it goes on a little bit longer after that. Now, to yeah. Nevermo listeners, that sounds like gibberish because, you know, it is. <laughs> but to our Exmo listeners, there is something very familiar about what Professor Fell deciphered from Mark Hoffman's forgery based on something an illiterate farm boy scribbled on a piece of paper for a gullible idiot to show to an actual professor. You following? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, great. Okay, the first Easy. words of the book, among the first words of the Book of Mormon are the following. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. Yea, I make a record in the language of my father, which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. For it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, my father having dwelt in Jerusalem all of his days. Now, again, no one knows exactly why Professor Fell did this, but in Mormondom, it's hard to overstate how big a deal this was. Hmm. Not only was this one of the first historical things ever that actually bolstered the story of the origin of the Golden Plates, it bolstered their historicity too. The leadership of the Mormon church had to have it. So hmm. Mark Hoffman met and sold it to Gordon B. Hinckley, then an apostle, um, and was rewarded with incredible access to chew the leadership of the church, instant notoriety and fame across Mormondom, as well as a $5 Mormon gold coin minted in 1850, a first edition of the Book of Mormon, and several samples of pioneer currency totaling about $20,000. So in this world of document trading and, and, and you know that, this kind of thing, it's often that people will not only pay with money, but they'll pay with other valuable documents. So it's mm. just kind of how it's done. Right. So Mark had created, had created an, uh, Hoffman had created an incredibly bold forgery, absolutely pulled one over on everyone, including prophets of God, and made a healthy chunk of change to boot. He was hooked. His next forgery was an act of incredible genius. He forged a patriarchal blessing, which we covered back in episode 31, given to Joseph Smith, to, uh, pardon me, given by Joseph Smith himself to his son, Joseph Smith III, in which he designated in no uncertain terms that Joseph Smith III was to be the next prophet of the church upon Joseph's oh, death. wow. That's like a – that talk about a, 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 a mail bomb. Yep. That's a torpedo below the, below the water line. That's huge, yeah. Um, and indeed, Joseph died not long later – not much later. We talked about that in episode 96. Yeah. Um, the blessing even bore the forged signature of Joseph Smith. Wow. Uh, a little context here. After he was killed, there was a succession crisis, which we covered in episode 77, yeah. which broke into two main camps, those who believed Joseph's eldest son should be the new prophet and those who thought it should be the most senior apostle, Brigham Young. Mm. The church that remained in Illinois renamed itself the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ, or RLDS. And to this day, they claim that it was Joseph's wish that the church remained in his bloodline. But there was no concrete proof until now. Right. So at mm. first... Hoffman took this to the church and had the uh, presented it to the archivist, uh, who clearly didn't read the, the body of the blessing and didn't want to pay Hoffman's price on it. Mar- uh, Hoffman offered it to him another time. He demurred again. So Mark decided to sell it to the reorganized church and set an appointment for the archivist of that church to fly to Salt Lake City and inspect it. Mm. However, when the existence of this document was brought to the attention of Gordon B. Hinckley, uh, by the way, Prophet Spencer W. Kimball was 86 and ailing at the time, so Hinckley was basically in charge. Hinckley instantly saw what an existential threat it represented and sent people scrambling to find Hoffman and to buy it and to buy the blessing. 
Um, by the time they got a hold of Hoffman, he had already been in negotiations with the RLDS church and had sent them a copy, a photocopy of the letter. Desperate, they begged Hoffman to break faith with the RLDS church and give the document to them. He finally agreed and was given another $20,000 worth of rare coins and documents. Um, however, well, because everything in this story is ham-fisted, when the RLDS church found out, they publicized the existence of the blessing, including the photocopy, uh. causing a national hubbub and forcing the Mormon church to confirm the existence of the letter and even later to present it to the RLDS church to try and mitigate the scandal. Um, which had made it all the way to the front page of the New York Times. Yeah, so basically what you're saying here, Doug, is that it, this document, which was not a real thing, but it would it, it was believed to be, would prove that the Brighamite Church, the Salt Lake City Mormons that we know today, are completely illegitimate. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And, and as we'll see, the church really never questioned the fucking veracity of these things. <laughs> right. Um, so having this document exposed was a huge embarrassment to the church <clears throat> and a huge source of amusement for Hoffman. However, in the wake of this PR disaster, the church was able to keep another potential source of embarrassment a secret. Hoffman had approached Gordon B. Hinckley with another forgery, mm. apparently a letter from Thomas Bullock, the man Hoffman claimed wrote down the, the notorious blessing that Joseph gave uh, to Brigham Young in 1860. So the, the letter is um, a letter from Bullock to Brigham Young confirming the existence of that patriarchal blessing and telling Young that Bullock felt obliged not to give it to him because he knew that Young would destroy it and that one day the leadership of the church must go back to the Smith family, right? Mm. So having found this letter, Hoffman claimed, in the same trove of documents as the blessing itself uh, that had caused so much trouble, Hoffer Hoffman offered it at no cost to the church. He was just that kind of guy. <laughs> um, and he was hitting his stride. Uh, he had become a fairly big deal in the esoteric world of document and signature trading and a towering figure in what was called the Mormon underground. I don't know if you guys remember this. Hmm. It was a gray market for Mormon historical documents that was frowned upon by church leadership but was engaged in by many devout Mormons as well as enemies of the church. Hmm. Uh, he was producing documents at an incredible rate at this point and trading them with others for authentic documents that he could then resell. Among the many he produced uh, were, the, were letters supposedly written – was a letter supposedly written by Lucy Max Smith, Joseph's mother, and Martin Harris. Um, these letters bolstered some of the church's claims about its origins and although a bit too dry to talk about here, found their way into the church's possession, prompting separate news conferences to display them in an attempt to bury the embarrassing um, fiascos of the last few months in good publicity. So – in a, stroke, uh, in a stroke of absolute genius that needs to be mentioned here, there were very few examples of Martin Harris's handwriting, which was odd for such a pivotal, pivotal figure in Mormon history. Having forged several documents by Harris and having sold them to many different unrelated collectors, now most of the examples of Harris's handwriting were actually Hoffman's handwriting. <laughs> so it was like... It was an Ouroboros. He, he, he made a closed loop of... Right. Of, exactly. Forgery proof. Yeah, it's crazy. He, it is, it is a known fact within the forgery world that uh, your own handwriting is the easiest to forge. Yeah, truly. <laughs> so Hoffman had become Harris. Uh, put a pin in that for a little later. Um, this was fertile ground for Hoffman, who in 1983 approached the church with another potentially damning, damaging document. In a letter he claimed to have found, written by Joseph Smith in 1825, addressed to Josiah Stowell, a farmer who Joseph worked for for a short time, um, after um, Hoffman took this letter and showed it to a church official and he read it, Hoffman was whisked post haste into the office of Gordon B. Hinckley. The letter was a set of instructions, again, written by Joseph Smith about how to exactly calibrate and use divining rods to discover buried treasure that were hidden <laughs> and obscured by clever spirits. Um, the date of this letter placed it right at the time when the church claims Joseph was being guided by the angel Moroni to the buried golden plates. Oh, that's so and smart. It, that's yeah. so smart. So smart. And because it, and we know release, that he because we know that he did do divining. That, that that's Joseph exactly right. Was a diviner. That's, yeah, and yeah. it's embar and it's embarrassing to the church, to the official church. <clears throat> yeah. And and we'll talk about why it's embarrassing too. Um they instantly agreed to pay fifteen thousand dollars for the document if Hoffman could get it authenticated, which he did. He had become such a talented forger that he took the letter to Charles Ham Hamilton, the most accomplished authenticator and forgery sniffer in the world, and he signed off on it. Wow. Uh, yeah. The church made good, made good on its price and swore Hoffman to secrecy before placing the document 
into the first presidency's vault. So only Hoffman, that guy Hamilton, the first presidency and the apostles knew about its, its existence. So this is official Mormonism burying what they think is its history. And they're convinced that it's legit. And that's right. why they're, they're burying it. Exactly. Right. Well, um, and what, the other thing that's amazing about it is that like for a, you can't get a better deal as a, as a forger than I'll sell you this thing and you'll never show it to anybody again. Yeah, like exactly. You get to keep forging forever if you do that, because yeah. nobody's nobody's going to get you in trouble. They're trying to hide it. Exactly. Yeah. So the sudden appearance of so many do- so many documents and the growth of the Mormon underground as an intellectual counterweight to the church hierarchy threw the leadership into a bit of a paranoid frenzy. Pardon me. Led by Boyd K. Packer, who was perhaps the most conservative apostle in Mormon history there was a serious and widespread crackdown on scholarship into the origins of the faith. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but, you know, Mormon security people were, were hanging outside of people's homes, getting license plate numbers, getting, you know, those names from the police. I mean, it was, it was bananas. Yeah. Um, but Hoffman's astounding prowess as a forger and the Mormon church's clear desperation to prevent more harmful documents from seeing the light of day would lead to the most daring and ambitious forgery yet and the most notorious – the White Salamander Letter. Yes. Um, this letter. I, I got to say though, there was no. This guy just kept turning up these these bombshell things, and they mm-hmm. never questioned it. Like, no. how can one guy keep finding quote unquote these these incredible pieces of very dangerous history? They just they're too credulous. Well, they're much too credulous, and once they kind of <laughs> believed the first few documents, they they you know they never questioned him again. Well, clearly yeah. he um, had the the sweet pipeline. Exactly, and he <laughs> that's what he claimed is he had a network and he yeah. knew how to hunt documents better than anybody else. He knew how to forge them better than anyone else. So, yeah, you know, he was half right. Yeah. Um, this letter, dated eighteen thirty, addressed to W. W. Phelps, a Mormon newspaper man, and written by again Martin Harris, um, who it, it bears mentioning is one of the three witnesses. His testimony yeah. appears in the first pages of the Book of Mormon. Every Book of Mormon in the world to this day as proof of its veracity. Right. So the letter starts by boasting about Joseph's innate ability to sense buried treasure and interpret dreams. <laughs> Harris then goes on to recount to Phelps Joseph's account of how he found the gold plates. Rather than being led to them by an angel Moroni, Joseph was shown the location of the plates by a spirit that manifested itself as a white salamander. Even more alarming, the white salamander was sort of a trickster spirit and demanded payment in the form of some part of Joseph's dead brother, Alvin. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So Joseph, in the, in the letter, Joseph manages to get possession of the plates, and the letter ends with a recounting of the Anthon transcript incident in Harris's own words. So huh. this is a potentially devastating document. Uh, you know, it calls into question the origin of the Book of Mormon and Joseph's divine authority. It wraps Joseph up again in money digging, black magic, and even necromancy. And it's written by one of the most important people in early Mormonism. So Hoffman was savvy enough not to take this to the church himself, as it might arouse some suspicion. So he had one of the document hunters under his employee, Lynn Richards Jacobs, approach the church with it. Surprisingly, the church at first rejected the purchase, probably fearful of being shaken down. So Hoffman approached the church, said he had heard about the letter from Jacobs, and would be willing to help the church secure it. (laughs) <laughs> he proposed they, I know he's he's a clever motherfucker. I would say, you know, uh he proposed that they find a wealthy Mormon to purchase the letter and then quietly donate it to the church sometime later. The wealthy Mormon they settled on was Stephen Christensen. Christensen uh huh. Christensen was about the same age as Hoffman. He was a bishop in the church and a very <laughs> successful businessman. He was also a document collector himself and even a supporter of the Mormon underground. Christensen uh, had made his fortune in an investment firm called Certified Financial Services with his partner and mentor, J. Gary Sheets, husband of Kathy. Um, For our local listeners, Christensen was also the son of Mac Christensen, owner of Mr. Mac Clothing Stores. Yes, indeed. Again, Small Lake City. (laughs) It's so crazy how everything is so interconnected here. Yeah, truly. Although the purpose of of this shell purchase was to keep this letter secret – Hoffman had, had already leaked uh, lines of it to members of the Mormon underground, and articles of it began to creep out, most notably from Ger- Gerald Tanner's uh, Salt Lake Messenger. 
Um, Tanner was a longtime enemy of the church and wanted perhaps more than anyone else th- for the letter to be authentic. But he and he alone had doubts. Um, the church did not share what turns out to have been Tanner's correct hesitation. <clears throat> this is, of course, the most damning part of the story. Not that the church believed it to be a forgery created by enemies of the church, which it was, but be- because they were convinced that it was real. Right. Because they knew that it, it at least rang true and was consistent with all the other shady shit they knew about Joseph Smith and were trying to keep hidden from their members. So <clears throat> public curiosity to see the letter exploded. Stephen Christensen, who had paid uh, Hoffman $15,000 for the letter and had it in his possession, released a statement that he would not release it publicly until its authenticity could be uh, established. So he set about doing exactly that. I, I'm kind of amazed by the, the prices of these things. Like fifteen grand is what Hoffman got for this? Yeah, I mean, this is these are nineteen eighty five dollars, mind you, but it still doesn't seem like a lot. But then again, think about it: it's fifteen thousand dollars for a small piece of paper, right? Right, that could bring down a church, that could bring down a, a multi billion dollar institution, right? But yeah. that's what the market was saying it was worth, I guess. Yeah, uh, I don't know <laughs> that it could bring it down. It would just make it look bad. Uh, but as we've learned over and over again, people will stay in a church that has crazy bullshit going on. Yes. Yeah. Well, there was one document that could conceivably have brought the church down. We'll talk about that near the end. Okay. Um, Christensen hired the best analysts in the world to examine the paper, the ink, the handwriting, and the language in the letter, and Hoffman fooled them all. Wow. Um, fueled by his skill and now towering hubris, Hoffman embarked on a forgery that would end up bringing this whole house of cards crashing down. He forged the oath of a free man. Now, hmm. the oath was a small printed loyalty pledge that members of the Massachusetts Bay Company were required to say as they arrived in America as early as the, as the 1630s. The oath conspicuously contains no, lo- no language, oh, pardon me, no loyalty pledge to the King of England. And aside from being the oldest printed document in the Americas, it is considered to be the earliest expression of American independence. So it's one of the most sought after valuable documents in the world. Huh. Um, indeed, it was uh, an inspiration for the Declaration of Independence. So although the text of the oath survives, no original copies of the document exist. This was too tantalizing a target for Hoffman, who in 1985 forged it and got it submitted to the Library of Congress for authentication. And here's where, where we get some real money. Word on the street was, if it was real, it might fetch upwards of $2 million. Right. Yeah. yeah. He was done with this small-time Mormon bullshit. He was ready to go to the big time. It's true. Um, at the same time, Christensen's firm had gone into a tailspin uh, due to falling oil prices and floundering real estate markets. Christensen asked the church if, he would, if they would allow him to sell the white salamander letter to raise money for his family since the cat was already out of the bag – but the church said no. So he turned the letter over at no profit to himself. Hmm. Um, in 1985, Time Magazine published a story called Challenging Mormonism's Roots, which forced the Mormon church to admit that the, to the letter from Smith to Stowell about the divining rods and the clever spirit. This is a bad time for the church. <laughs> wow. Okay. So meanwhile, the Library of Congress let Hoffman know that it could not unauthenticate the oath of a free man and therefore wanted to buy it. It appeared by all their analysis to be at least as old as the actual oldest printed document in the Americas, Stephen Day's Bay, Bay Psalm book. Hoffman set the price at $1.5 million, but the Library of Congress balked at the price. So suddenly, Hoffman had to try and find another buyer. This set in motion all the events that would come. Hoffman owed money all over town to the tune of several hundreds of thousands of dollars to various investors who were starting to get suspicious. He was counting on the sale of the oath to solve all his financial woes, And the longer it took to sell and the less it sold for, the more desperate Hoffman got. So extremely desperate for cash, Hoffman approached the church claiming to have found the McClellan Collection. This was another potentially damaging series of documents written by one William McClellan between 1831 and 1838. McClellan was a very close friend of Joseph Smith who then left the church because of Smith's serial child rape, authoritarian tendencies, and constant dishonesty. <clears throat> which he apparently documented in, in, these, in this collection. Mm. Huh. Hoffman set the price for this at 185000 Although the church did not want to write a check that large in case it was discovered, they had a general authority named Hugh Pinnock, a director of First National Bank, cut a check for Hoffman from the bank. Um, wow. The thing was, I know, right? So there's kind of a bank fraud thing going on here, maybe. There's kind of, yeah. Yeah. 
um, uh, the thing was the McClellan collection did not exist, or at least Hoffman didn't have it. Hoffman just needed the money. Oh my God. Uh, but now Hoffman had to add the church to the list of people he owed money to. The walls were closing in. This leads us to October 15, 1985, and the two bombings. Um, how all this is related to is about to become clear, but at the time, nobody could understand uh, who was doing this or why. After the bombings, on the same day, Hoffman met with Dallin H. Oaks, another apostle, um, and one of the old men we saw waving the handkerchief around <laughs> pathetically a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hoffman thought uh, if the bombings would be all that Oaks and the church would be thinking about, um, it would buy him some time, but to his surprise, they were even more desperate to get their hands on the McClellan collection. Um, hmm. So the next day, the bomb in Hoffman's car exploded, badly injuring him. It did not take long for the police to begin to suspect Hoffman, but there was still a ton of uncertainty about the motive and what connected the three victims. Um, as the possibility sunk in that Hoffman might be the bomber, his father visited him in the hospital and said the following, quote, if Satan, go if Satan got hold of you, son, and you've committed these acts, you should confess and ask for the firing squad uh, so that you can be with us in the next life. This wow. was, of course, Hoffman's father's adherence to the doctrine of blood atonement that we talked about back in episode 50. Wow. Uh, this, yeah, I know, right? Nice guy. Well, you know, Mormonism is all about family. <laughs> and I think that's, that's the lesson we can take from this. So at this point, uh, Hoffman still denied being the bomber. Uh, after several weeks, the case against Hoffman was losing wind. Several of Hoffman's associates passed lie detector tests, as did Hoffman, uh, by such a wide margin that prosecutors were getting cold feet, bringing it to prosecution. Um, they began to explore the possibility that it was the, a group of Danites, an ancient Mormon vigilante oh force. God. Or you'll love this, even a group of violent homosexuals bent on revenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they, they gave that more than a second thought. Watch out, motherfuckers. We're coming for you. <laughs> but what brought suspicion back to Hoffman was something nobody saw coming. Hoffman claimed to have the McClellan collection under contract and under lock and key. It surprised pretty much everyone when the Salt Lake Tribune claimed to be in contact with the actual owner of the collection, who said he never even heard of Mark Hoffman until now. Huh. The collection, it turns out, had found its way into the possession of a Texas man named Otis Trauber through a crazy and labyrinthian set of circumstances too complex to recount here. But when he saw the news uh, that the bombing spree in Utah was related to something he owned, he put the collection into a safe deposit box. So there actually um, was a, a collection? Or this was a real thing? This was a real thing. Oh, wow. And an incredibly intrepid reporter from, from the Salt Lake Tribune named Don Tracy uh, actually managed to track down Trauber, and he agreed to show the collection to her, excerpts of which were published in the Tribune. The revelations in the McClellan collection were as damning as the church feared. McClellan had, uh, had been close friends to Joseph Smith from 1831 to 38 before becoming disgusted by his actions. So ironically and again, in their gullibility and desperation to hide damaging materials, the church it, authorities it gets exposed. accelerated their release and propelled them onto front pages around the country. Wow. Uh, so the fact that Hoffman had never, ha had never even come close to securing the collection meant that he had been extorting the church, which cast a new shadow over everything he had been involved, had been involved in. Forensic experts uh, for the prosecution started to suspect that, the, that in spite of the fact that all the documents were, say, on 19th century paper with iron galatonic ink, they might be forgeries. However, after three months of intensive investigation by the FBI, <laughs> they concluded that the salamander letter, for example, was authentic. Wow. Really? Yes. Um, prosecutors were able to finally poke enough holes in Hoffman's accounts and documents, um, not the documents themselves, the, the accounts of how he got them, that in February 1986, they arrested him for first-degree murder uh, of Stephen Christensen and Kath, uh, Kathleen Sheets, um, as well as 23, crown, 23 counts of fraud, including against Gordon B. Hinckley personally and the church, as well as many others. Wow. Hmm. Um, in late 1986, prosecutors and the defense team reached a plea bargain. Hoffman would admit to the murders and the forgeries and describe in detail how he pulled it all off. In return, he would be, only be charged with two counts of second-degree murder. The families and the community and the, uh, the, 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 the families and the community would have resolution and Hoffman would not face the, the, the firing squad. The police department and both families had to agree to this deal. True to his word, however, Hoffman's father refused the deal. If his son was the murderer, he must face the firing squad and spill his blood on the ground. Holy shit. Wait, why does his father get to refuse the deal on his behalf? 
the families had to accept the deal. It's just part of the, how the plea oh, bargain was. Including his own family? Inclu- including his own family, yeah. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, in another of the many improbable turns in this saga, the prosecutors and the defense team appealed to the church leadership to help them with this quandary. Eager for this to be over as quickly as possible, <laughs> the church produced a pronouncement that blood atonement was inappropriate until civil authority was merged with religious authority in the, ki- in the coming kingdom of God. <laughs> this was enough for the elder Hoffman. And in January of 1987, prosecutors sat down with Hoffman, who laid out in full detail every twist and turn of his nefarious deeds. The tale he spun was chilling. Uh, over donuts and uh, milk, he described that the mounting pressure from all his investors and the delay of the sale of the oath of a free man made him decide that he needed to kill someone to buy some time. He designed and even tested the bombs before he had, he had even decided who he would use them on. Um, he settled on Stephen Christensen, whose death would probably buy him the most time, and on Christensen's uh, business partner, Gary Sheets. Um, he figured the financial trouble of their shared business might send the prosecutors in the wrong direction for a while, which it did. Um, hmm. Gary Sheets, however, left on the morning of October 15th without noticing the package left in front of his garage door. Hmm. His wife, Kathy, did notice, and even though she was not uh, the intended target, her death had the intended result, at least for a while. Uh, another crazy twist was uh, Hoffman had only built two bombs and indeed only intended to kill two people. He thought that that would be enough to get the church to calm down about getting their hands on the McClellan collection long enough for him to sell the oath. When the church told him they still wanted the collection ASAP, he built a third bomb that day. Wow. One of the only enduring mysteries of, from this entire saga is who that third bomb was meant for. You know, Hoffman claimed he was trying to kill himself to protect his family, but nobody really believes that. Right. Um, the prevailing belief is that he was trying to blow up his car to make it look like he was a target at the same time being able to say that several of the, of the promised documents he needed to settle his debts <sighs> were in the car, including the McClellan collection, were in the car and now destroyed. Right. Uh, he just it's fucked the up. The dog and, ate my homework. <laughs> pretty much. Um, it's the perfect crime. Hoffman went on to admit that everything – all of the controversial and valuable documents were forgeries done by him alone. He described his methods, which involved taking leaf pages out of books from the exact time period he was mimicking and using old recipes for homemade ink that were actually pretty readily available. Um, he, would, he, he burned 17th century leather into the liquid to fool radiocarbon dating. He used weevils to mimic the holes and droppings of centuries dead bookworms. Uh-huh. He fabricated movable typeface and then aged it with steel wool. <clears throat> Um, and then he would put himself in the character of who he was forging, studied the existing examples of their handwriting, and practiced, practiced, practiced. He was meticulous, deliberate, and manipulative, and it had not only worked almost every time, but it had fooled the highest levels of forensic science in the whole world. Wow. Um, he forged the handwriting and, uh, handwriting and signatures of George Washington, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Billy the Kid, Andrew Jackson, Mark Twain, Francis Scott Key, Abraham Lincoln, John Milton, and Miles Standish, among many others. And to be clear, he never got caught for forgery. Wow. After his sentencing, he met several more times with prosecutors and told them one final amazing fact. His next major uh, forgery was to be the lost 116 pages of the Book of Mormon. Wow. For those who don't know, these were the pages dictated by Joseph Smith and written down by... Martin Harris, right. that were supposed to be the first book in the Book of Mormon. Harris took these pages to show them to his wife, and then they were lost to history. Joseph, knowing he had made it up, and that if he tried to duplicate it, it wouldn't match the original pages, sensed a trap, and so he started over with what was supposed to be the second book in the Book of Mormon, that's now the first, the Book of Nephi. Right. However, the existence of the 116 pages and the potentially contradictory and damaging things in them has always kept church authorities up at night. And yeah, Hoffman, the, fir- the first draft of the Book of Mormon. Right. Yeah. And Hoffman, now literally writing as Martin Harris, had planned on forging the most damaging document possible for the church. So just one of those things, if the oath of a free man had sold a little sooner, none of what came next would have happened, and Hoffman might have pulled off a forgery that could have destroyed the Mormon church. <laughs> So, <laughs> and that was his intent, wasn't it? It that wasn't was his, really he to was get intending rich. to do that. He had planned that from basically the beginning. He, wow. he wanted to destroy the church. He had yep. that big an axe to grind. Yeah, yep. and, and making himself into Martin Harris was all part of the plan. And if he hadn't been greedy about it, if he hadn't been like, if he hadn't been into the money part of things, he could have pulled it off. He almost got away with it. 
That's and again, crazy. His forging, his forgery was absolutely next level. That's crazy. Crazy. Wow. crazy. Now he sits he's, in a jail. He's still cell. alive. Yeah, he's still alive down in uh, the point of the mountain prison, yep. not far he's, from Salt Lake. He got, uh, you know, his. He didn't get the firing squad, but he's going to die in prison. Yeah, he was, and he was Ron Lafferty's cellmate for a long time. That. <laughs> That's, That's true. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another story for another day. Well, Doug, that was a very in-depth and amazing Oof. and super fucking weird report. But da 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 da. Mormons. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, everybody, everybody, take a, a a drink and let's move on. Hey, fellas. Hello. We. Oui. Let me tell you something. Uh, we like to do this show and, uh, a lot of people like to listen to it. And some of those people are awesome and want to give us a little bit of cash. We like to it. do this show even on days when the technical difficulties that you never hear are making us half <laughs> fucking insane. We really hope you don't hear it. Uh, yeah. There may be some slight differences. Uncle Doug may sound weird sometimes. You never know. I sound weird but most of the time. It's been a day. Uh, but we, but regardless of that, people still seem to value what we do, and we owe them thanks for that. Uh, so, got a lot of folks to thank today. Uh, thanks go to Tim, Julie, Cat, uh, and then this person who calls themselves. And please don't flatter Uncle Doug like this in the future. <laughs> but for now, they're calling themselves Uncle Doug. Does more to me with his voice than most men can do with their hands. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> Congratulations on that, Uncle Doug. Uh, <laughs> Betty, thank you so much. Dave, uh, Ariel, uh, Crystal, Tim. Hey, Tim. Uh, and we owe some heavens. Damn. Gentlemen. Oh, boy. Uh, we, got some, we got some people coming in strong. So, Uncle Doug... Uh, you, we have a, 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 a once a, a current patron has bumped their patronage up so high that even though uh, they were they they were saying they didn't necessarily need a heaven, we're giving it. All right. So, Uncle Doug, you're giving your heaven to Devin. All right, Devin, you may not want one, but you're getting a heaven anyway. You see, Devin, you motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. De- 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 people should know. Devin wrote in to tell us that that she had to bump her patronage down a bit. But she's she's returned to the heaven level. Um, she's however, she passed she, the heaven level. But no, she passed the heaven level. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, she yeah. shot over the heaven level. She and overshot is now the out. celestial kingdom. That's yeah, right. Exactly. And she graciously, graciously said that we didn't need to bestow a heaven on her. Uh, but then she called uh, me out for saying for sa- sainting her with a saint that I had apparently already used. <laughs> you, Listen you, here, you're Devin. You're double sainted. <laughs> Listen here, Devin. Your uncle Doug is how do you say sometimes not that creative. So sue me. <laughs> yeah. And furthermore, did it ever occur to you that maybe, just maybe, two people could have the same saint? Hmm? Mean, who are you to call me out in private? What do you think you are, smarter than me? Are you some kind of brain sciencey thing? Huh? She is. Well, Devin. 100%, 100% she, she is. She is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a fact. Um, you said you don't want a heaven, but you're not getting off that easy. For your petulance and clear superior value to society over me, here's your heaven. <laughs> When the piano lands on your head and you are squashed out of this earthly existence, (laughs) in the twinkling of an eye, you are transported to what looks like, at least to your primitive eyes, the perfect city of the future. Incredible, impossible gleaming towers stretch into the clouds. Trains that seem to run on invisible tracks silently stream by above. The streets are shiny metal, polished to a mirror-like finish. She went to Atlas Shrugged Heaven, is that what you're saying? (laughs) Uh, It's not crowded, but there are people. Beautiful people. Tall, fit, well-dressed. They enthusiastically greet you as, you as they pass you by. You notice the ground level of each building is a super high-end retail uh, store. Clothing, purses, watches, shoes, all with brand names you've never heard of and of a quality you'd never thought possible. You also notice that each of these items has a small tag inscribed with, Free for Devon. <laughs> um, dispersed to the retail shops are five-star restaurants. With the rich smell of the world's finest French, Italian, Chinese, Mexican, and Moroccan cuisine, each taking turns enticing your nostrils. In each restaurant, there's a sign in the window, no waiting for Devon, come on in. (laughs) As you stroll down the flawless avenue, you pass a five-star hotel. You glimpse in to see a lobby of such exquisite ornateness, it just takes your breath away. In the middle, there's a gold stanchion with the words, presidential suite reserved for Devon. You turn, down, you, you turn around and take in the vista. 
the perfect street in the perfect city for the perfect person. Or at least the person who thinks she's perfect. More perfect than me anyway. <laughs> Your eye catches something unexpected. A tall, beautiful woman who looks ever so much like Lapita Nyong'o strides, strides along like, as though she was on a runway. But wow, she's missing a hand. That's <laughs> weird. Across the street, you see a beautiful man like Chris, Chris Hemsworth as Thor, but in a wonderfully tailored suit. But he's missing an entire arm. Another woman with olive skin and black silky hair to her waist passes and smiles at you. She's missing every other tooth. You realize as you look around, everyone, everyone is missing something. The illusion of utter perfection begins to shatter as you start to cross the street. So you don't notice that you're crossing against the light. All the beautiful people, all the beautiful yet incomplete people stop and stare at you in horror. A booming voice rains down from heaven and says, jaywalking is not allowed. (laughs) That voice, it's... It's your voice. Then you hear a little pop, almost like a knuckle cracking. So you look down at your right hand, and your index finger is gone. No blood, no scar, almost like it was never there in the first place. You retreat back across the street and collapse on the curb, trying to figure out what's going on. That voice, your voice, rings out again. Loitering is not allowed. Pop. There goes your middle finger. (laughs) You pull yourself to your feet and stumble over to a store window. You put your hand on it to stabilize yourself, and again, your voice comes booming. Smudging windows and bad posture are not allowed. Pop, (laughs) pop. You look in horror at the lonely thumb on your right hand as you realize what your eternity now is. Your heaven is to live up to the exacting standards of an all-powerful, all-seeing you. (laughs) You could have gone a little easier on your audio uncles, but it's too late now, so enjoy. Pop. This is what you get for giving us a lot of money, people. You're right. <laughs> Screw you, you generous fuck. Yeah. Oh, Devin, enjoy that. <laughs> Good Lord. Wow. Okay, well, you know, Devin's not the only, like, utterly generous person out there. And I now have to give a heaven as well. And this heaven goes to Naomi. Hmm. So, uh, Naomi, this one's for you. Space. The final frontier. Well, yours anyway, because like the Mormons, your everlasting journey beyond this mortal coil ain't going to take place on this pale blue dot. No, Naomi, you're going to the furthest reaches of the universe in an adventure that will have you on the edge of your captain's chair. That's right, Naomi. You're going to sci-fi heaven. (laughs) Afterlife log, stardate unclear. <laughs> We've sounded yellow alert as we, as we are venturing deep into the Cylon Nebula, where no one has gone before. Other than, the all, other than all the people who have, of course. We've engaged our Vorlon drive to ensure maximum speed as our beryllium hyperspace, hyperspace modulators have been offline. We hope to soon make contact with the holographic beings on the distant planet of Alpha Omicron Pi, where, if we make it through their hazing ritual, we will pledge to keep their society safe. (laughs) That's right, Naomi. Your afterlife will be a non-stop saga, traveling to uncharted reaches of space, reaching out to unknown civilizations, and then coming back to refuel, pick up some replacement red shirts, and report (laughs) on what you saw and did. Fire proton torpedoes! There are Grand Moff Tarkins on the starboard bow. (laughs) Tune your universal translator to the weirding way to hear the strange but beautiful song of the mysterious race known as the Tricorders. Let's go back to the bar at the spaceport and drink some Daleks as we laugh about our adventures on Huragok 5 floating down the River Tam. Of course, always being in places where you don't know what to expect can lead to a strange feeling that things are never quite right. Anxiety will be your constant companion as you hurtle through vasty nothingness, trying to make sense of it all. Why do the race known as the Glitter Boys always attack us, even after we've made peace? Why do we swear not to disturb alien civilizations we deem not ready for contact, but then inevitably barge into their lives somehow? Why can I never find Vogons big enough to fit my feet? (laughs) Eventually... As you pass through the season after season, you'll realize that it all starts to feel a little formulaic. You'll spend entire missions focused on the character development of a single crew member. Encounters with alien life will become increasingly dramatic 
and then one day your command will be canceled, and you'll have to and you'll have to go to a new interplanetary union to give you a ship and crew, just so you'll have some sense of purpose because. Once you've seen the stars, that homestead back in Labar, Iowa, loses all its folksy luster. So back into space with you, Naomi. Fire all your holodecks. Pew, pew. <laughs> Drink some Qui-Gon gin and then Ferengi right back to your Reavers for some well-deserved Cree droid. Mandalorian! <laughs> Uh, you know, four, four nerds just <clears throat> literally died of an aneurysm right now. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, so there you go. Thank you guys so much for for your uh, support. We yes. appreciate it. <clears throat> Remember that there is, a, we forgot to mention it at the top of the show, there is a Zoom meetup coming up this Wednesday. If you hear this by then, uh, all of our uh, patrons have access to an early version of the show, so they'll have heard it. Uh, so write into us at uh, howto at howtoheretic.com. And put Zoom in the uh, in the subject line if you want to be a part of that. And if you want to become a patron yourself, you can always go to howtoheretic.com and click on the support us or whatever it is button. Yep. And then uh, and then you get to give us money. What a privilege that is for you. <laughs> You will be blessed. You will be it's seed money. It's really seed money. So, and if you can't give us seed money, you can give us seed stars, like just like Dan was talking about uh, with right. Naomi's Heaven. So, uh, give us five stars. It's free. It doesn't it's no no skin off your nose, uh, and it just helps us feel a little better about us ourselves because we're just miserable middle aged men. So do that, and uh, we love you. Thank you so much. Stay safe, and let's move on. Uh, Heretics, we are very, very fortunate today to have uh, a special guest on the show. Uh, Jared Yates Sexton is a professor, a journalist, and the author of several books, including The People Are Going to Rise Like the Waters on Your Shore, A Story of American Rage, and more importantly for our discussion today, American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People, which comes out in September. I've pre-ordered my copy, and I have a feeling that after today's discussion, you will want to as well. Jared Yates Sexton, welcome to the How to Heretic. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, lovely to have you. Um, so, theocracy here in America. <laughs> I came, I came across a long Twitter thread you did on March twenty second, and I knew we had to talk to you. We talk a lot about theocracy on this show, and after some long thought and consideration, eh, we're against it. Not a good way to run a society, but. Anyone really paying attention to the multiple snowballing crises we are facing uh, as a country right now knows we are hurtling toward a serious grab for some kind of Christian death cult supply side theocracy as we speak. So Sounds terrible when you say it that way. <laughs> it does sound really super shitty. So, Jared, American theocracy, we may be hurtling toward it, but you argue we're already neck deep in it and that it all began with a little thing called the Confederate States of America. Yeah, so um for for the book uh that we're talking mm. about American rule. Um I I sort of needed to go back into American history which you know, I I I have a basis in it. I've I've been educated in it. I've looked into it. I've spent my time reading all these history books. I feel like I I I felt like I had a good understanding of American history and Sure. I, but I think like a lot of other Americans, um, that faith in my own understanding of history was shattered in November 2016. <laughs> and, you know, like everybody, well, not everybody else. Obviously, there were people who thought that Donald Trump could win. But for those of us who thought there was no possible way that this person could win the presidency. Yeah, um, this absurd clown. Right. This absolute buffoon. There was no right. way possible <laughs> that he could, you know, win after after everything. And right. when it happened, it shattered my understanding of my faith in history. And so what I did was I decided to go back and start from the very beginning and um, start to start to really understand like the parts of American history that I didn't have a full understanding of, because there's like all these parts that, Hmm. you know, when when you're in school, like they'll mention them, you know, it'll be like the Korean War was then. And then it, yeah. you know you move on, and that's it. And you don't learn. Yeah, about you it. remember some some dates and a couple generals' names, and if you're done. That right? right, you know. And and there's all these parts in the the history books that are like one paragraph long, and you're like, no, I think there's a bigger story here than than I understand. And so I went back to the very beginning, and you know, 
the way it works. I, I've realized that the the founding of the United States was problematic and didn't work the way that we all thought it did or, or were told. So right. I started making my way through American history and I got to um, the Civil War. And, yeah. you know, this was one of those things I've always been kind of fascinated by um, because the Confederate States of America is this point in American history where all of America's ills sort of coalesce, coagulate <laughs> into this disease, right? This like open yeah. wound. And none of the history books that I read really talked about the Confederate States of America. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, I was talking about this with somebody else the other day, like most of the books about the Civil War are about, oh, Robert E. Lee looked great in his jacket and he made this amazing military maneuver, you know? Yeah. And and instead, yeah. and it was all based on like the military gamesmanship and how things worked, but it didn't really get into Confederate culture. And right. so what I did was I started tracking down everything that I could find written about the Confederate States of America, which actually it's very little because it's not a period we like to talk about because it actually reflects the worst parts of American history and culture. Hmm. And what I found was that the Confederate States didn't secede and form their own country as if they wanted to create a new country. They actually believed that they were the true United States of America and mm. that the rift between the North and the South was actually a betrayal by the North of the South. And that uh, because they had been betrayed, that they were going to take over what the founders had started. So what you find in huh. all of the Confederate iconography is you find all of the founding fathers, particularly George Washington, tons of statues and parts of him he's on the seal all this stuff but you also find and this is buried until you start looking in the right places and it's buried for a specific reason the confederate states of america was based on christian theology it was based Mm -hmm. on the idea that the christian god was a racist white supremacist god who had determined that blacks should be slaves and that whites should be their masters and that would be the makeup of society right and so it's this incredibly Uh, like overt and awful manipulative society in which you have Confederate preachers who are preaching this constant perverted Christian racist theology. And and it's all based on the idea of the entirety of the South was indoctrinated to believe that they were God's chosen people and that they would win the civil war. But when they lost a battle, the preachers and the politicians would declare days of religious humiliation where you wouldn't leave the Mm. house and you would just bow down to God and apologize until you won the next battle. And, you know, all of these bizarre Christian cultish behaviors. And so what you actually find is the Confederate States of America, as we didn't know it, was a Christian theocracy in action. And that is um, that is one of the reasons why it ended up being this like racist white supremacist dystopia. Right. And, and, uh, you know, we talked a little bit, uh, before we taping it that, that look, the, they're, they're using the scripture, they're using the Bible, uh, as a justification for slavery and the abolitionists using the Bible as justification to fight slavery. They're both right. Right. And, and, you know, as, as again, we talked a little bit about this. I, I think that the real heart of the, Amer- of American Christianity lies in the old Testament and not in the gospels of Jesus. Oh, and that's where all of this uh, takes place, right? And and we're going to yeah. talk a lot before this podcast is over about the division yeah. between the Old and the New Testament and how that is completely, um, you know, screwed up American politics and, and how dangerous it's been. But you're absolutely right. It was a rageful Christianity. And meanwhile, in the North, and, and this is one of those things, um, we talked about this too, um, you know, everybody, like when they learn about the Civil War, they're told that the North was this like heroic anti-slavery coalition and it was all about freeing the slaves. That's all bullshit. That's not actually true. Um, right. You know, so I and, and again, I, I come from Indiana. I, I, you know, we're one of what, five or six states that fights over the right to call Abraham Lincoln our own. And <laughs> in, in absolute truth, Abraham Lincoln was a white supremacist. And hmm. Abraham Lincoln, in his speeches, including the famous debates and, you know, all of these addresses, he's like, well, you know, I don't necessarily want there to be slavery, but as long as there is a divide between whites and blacks, I want the whites to be supreme. And hmm. there are even these times, and this is the, the craziest thing, 
where he's trying to sell the slaves to other countries. Uh, he was on the record trying to sell African American slaves to uh, Great Britain to move them out. This is where like Lib- all of them. Yeah, absolutely. To to offload them to another country. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's where Liberia comes from, right? Right, it's, Liberia. He yeah. he actually sends a group of slaves uh, to uh, an island, and they start succumbing to starvation and disease, and they bring them back just like the surviving few. And so hmm. what we actually find, and, and there's this other moment too, where, uh, you know, Lincoln tells everybody, he's like, there, there will never be peace in America until, you know, African Americans are gone. And so he actually hmm. meets with a coalition of like Frederick Douglass and other African American leaders. And he's like, uh, you need to convince your people to leave America. And they're like, we're sorry, but we're American. And so this is like the first time that Lincoln's actually pushed on this thing. So what we actually have is this myth of America in which Lincoln was somehow or another, well, not somehow or another, it was actively done, turned into a messiah figure, right? Right. So there's this idea within the Confederacy and within the Civil War, and it's all, you know, religious myth turned into secular myth. Um, Right. So just to take listeners through a quick little weird thing, we need to talk about black Easter, 1865. Yeah. 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 So this is weird. And like this, this made me do a double take when I originally found it, because this isn't something that we're taught because once you start looking at it, you start to realize like the weirdness of it. Right. (laughs) So, uh, I believe it was on Palm Sunday is when Lee surrenders to grant at, uh, Appomattox. And that starts off the Holy Week. So then on Good Friday, and this is right after the Civil War has ended. And remember that the Civil War is this apocalyptic battle. It didn't seem like it was ever going to end. And, you know, the the death toll is unbelievable. The carnage is terrible. It's just an apocalypse in America. So it ends on Palm Sunday. And then on Good Friday, Lincoln is shot at uh, Ford's Theater. Yeah. So he shot on Good Friday. He dies the Saturday afterwards. And so then the first Easter, which again is all about the solstice and rebirth, right? It's all about yeah. like uh, renewal. renewal and resurrection. America ends the bloody civil war and Lincoln dies the day after Good Friday. He gets shot on Good Friday and then dies on Saturday. So that Sunday, that Easter Sunday, Black Easter, 1865, suddenly all of, especially the northern preachers, hold their sermons where they are taking Lincoln and Christ, and they put them on the exact same level because he is an American martyr. He was sent here, right, right to die right. for our sins. And, you know, there's like all these op-eds, <clears throat> all these essays, all these parts that are talking about Lincoln being the Messiah of America. And you start finding these... Um, well, there's no other way to put it. They're batshit. These batshit pieces <laughs> of art. And 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 again, like I, I want I, I don't like to tell listeners what to do, but pause this thing, go Google mm-hmm. it, spend a couple of minutes and just lose your mind. I don't know if you've seen them. I, I have seen them and they are and I I they felt I, they were reflexively a little creepy. They're really um, creepy. <laughs> but I with knowing all this now, going back and putting my eyes on it again, they're gonna be super creepy. Okay. So everybody, you just or, or listen and just go do it. Whatever. We're we're a multitasking culture. So yeah. what happened? is all of a sudden this popular art starts coming into uh you know popularity that's very redundant but true and so what (laughs) ends up happening is you start getting all of these pieces of popular art that show george washington in heaven surrounded by choirs of angels welcoming abraham lincoln into heaven and right. you start finding this weird secular bastardization of the Christian myth. All of a sudden, you have George Washington as the father. You have freedom and liberty as the Holy Spirit. And you have Abraham Lincoln as the son and the martyr and the Messiah. And so all of a sudden in American history, you start seeing an intertangling of public and secular and, and all these bizarre Uh, mutations of a Christian national white myth. And the belief is that Lincoln as a Messiah has forgiven us our sin of white supremacy and slavery. And now America is washed clean and ready to begin its new destiny. Right. And then, pardon me. And then no, we're, we're done having to deal with racism. That's all that's behind us. Why would you ever have to deal with racism again? It's just gone. That's right. We were cleansed in the blood of the, you know, of of Abraham Lincoln and the Republic. And we're all done with that. 
Yeah, why would you ever have another problem with racism? So what ends up happening, and and this is the thing, and for um, your listeners who might not have heard me talk about this before, um, this is the basis of what I've come to call the cult of the Shining City. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, I brought that name out and I've, I've gotten a little bit of pushback. People are like, well, there's nobody out there who calls themselves the cult of the Shining City. I'm like, I'm well aware. You know, these are people, um, these are white identity evangelicals. And that is mm-hmm. a specific group of evangelicals. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and anybody who's listening who has uh, been a part of this knows what I'm talking about. It's a group of people who are brought up to believe that they are the chosen people as Americans and as white Americans. And that there is this conspiracy against them and against America. It takes the uh, takes the form of the New World Order. It, now it's the deep state yeah. or QAnon conspiracies, all this stuff. And what I ended up finding out, and I had no idea because I grew up in this thing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I grew up in a very extremist, Baptist, Pentecostal type of um, childhood. and So fortunate. That must have been wonderful. Yeah, I'm not dealing with those problems to this very day still. <laughs> it's all behind me. <laughs> right. And, and so, like, you know, I grew up in this very, again, bad shit situation where, you know, I, I got taught how to do battle with Satan. Like, if he showed up in my living room, I was ready to duke it out with the Prince of Darkness. As a and, child, right? As a child. <laughs> And like, you know, I would have, um, you know, I would have like health problems and like they would talk to me about like, maybe I had a demon inside of me, right? (laughs) Maybe, maybe the forces of evil. And I remember there's this really bizarre thing. And when I tell people, and, and you and I were talking about this before we started taping, when you talk to people who don't have this experience, it sounds so insane, you know? Yeah. And I, I, like, I'll never forget I was seven years old and there, um, this was back and we're going to get to Ronald Reagan in a minute and we're going to talk about, um, you know, satanic panic and, and how this yep. all came about. But I we're remember play all the hits. Oh yeah. Just hang tight. <laughs> old man's going to come up here in a second. Yeah. And I remember being like seven or eight years old and there was like uh, an NBC special about demonic possession. Mm-hmm. You know, that used to be a thing or, you know, uh, unsolved mysteries at eight, demonic possession at nine. And yeah. I remember I asked my grandmother, I was like, is demonic possession real? And she's like, oh, yeah, it's definitely for real. And I asked her, I said, well, how do demons possess you? And she said, well, they get you while you're asleep. Ugh. You know, and so like for the next, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine months, I tried not to sleep. Right. Yeah, my I had an aunt who did exactly the same thing to me, and it was at, at a at a very tender age, and it was a nightmarish year. Right. Of- Exactly. Of hallucinating because I was trying not to sleep. Exactly. And so we yeah. would, you know, we we lived in this older house. We were very, very poor. And like the house would creak, you know, over the course of the night. And my grandmother would talk about how it was spirits and, you know, like the past, all this nonsense, you know, yeah. that, that is just indoctrinated. Child abuse. It's child abuse. That's exactly yeah. right. And Absolutely. so we we I grew up in this. This was, um, unfortunately, I didn't realize it was a cultish environment. You know, I lived yeah. in a small town. Um, I write about this often. I, I grew up in this small town that is um, notorious for having one of the largest like 4th of July celebrations like in, in the Midwest. Um, you know, it's very... The pay- real the real America. Is real, what capital R, capital A, real America. And, yeah. you know, grew up in this town where, you know, we were fed a steady diet of, of white identity nationalism. You know, Mm -hmm. mixed in with this, um, you know, Christian occultism. And I had no idea that my preacher and other preachers and other community leaders were pushing this old Confederate theology. Um, I just thought it was Christianity. Right. You just that. Well, you just it was normal to you. You Yeah. When you're in a cult, you don't always know you're in a cult. You know, like finding out you're in a cult is one of the first moments where you're like, maybe I should get out of this fucking cult. And. That's not what you know when you grew up in it, you know? It's no. it's Plato's cave. Like you're in the cave, right. you don't know there's a life outside of it. And Yeah, and you trust you you know, as a child of course you have to trust your elders and and what they say is how things are. They're doing their due diligence, why wouldn't they? Well, especially in a cult. 
your yeah. elders are unquestionable. And, yeah. you know, there, I assume there are people listening who can relate to this. You know, cults. A lot. <laughs> yeah, right. Cults tell their, their, um, their devotees, they're like, you cannot listen to anyone outside of this cult. Right. Right. You can't. And by the way, this is all Christian uh, culture war shit. It's like, yeah. you can't listen to these <laughs> records. You can't watch these movies. If your friend's not in the church, they can't be your friend anymore. And so what they do is they continually, continually insulate you until you don't understand that there's a world outside of it. Exactly. Now, yeah. I, I didn't realize that I was in a cult until Donald Trump really became uh, prevalent. And, hmm. you know, and, and the church and the people that I knew, I'd always known there was deep, deep hypocrisy in the church. And sure. I, I left the church at an early age. I was one of those people who at like, you know, 13 or 14, I was like, there's something wrong here. And, <laughs> and I don't trust this. And, you know, obviously I was alone in that, couldn't talk to anybody. And then, you know, I was... We, we've had very parallel lives, Jared. <laughs> thank you. I, you know, I think there's a path that a lot of us have found, right? Yep. And yep. so, you you know, you start reading the books that people don't know that you're reading and you start listening to the music they don't know you're listening. And the next thing you know, by the time you're 16 or 17, you are just like an aggressive atheist or, you know. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, I, I left it when I was in my teens, but my understanding of it didn't really come into full fruition until this happened. And and like a lot of people, I watched as the evangelical church uh, rallied around Trump. Mm -hmm. And when people started saying like, man, it really seems like the church is hypocritical when it comes to Trump. I was like, well, of course they're hypocritical. They're, they're hypocrites. And mm -hmm. I had want, you know, I would... Man, this is – I never thought I was going to be talking about this on a podcast. You know, <laughs> it was like one of those things where like I wanted to be a preacher when I was a little kid. Huh. And one of the things that made me decide not to was the preacher – we had one of those charismatics, right? Right. He was incredibly charismatic and, and just he, – he was a rock star is what he was. Right. And, you know, he'd get up there and he would sweat and scream about, you know, fire and brimstone and sins and eternal damnation. And in a way, you know, that's almost like the Stones playing their greatest hits. Right. And he ended up having an affair with the head deacon's wife. And, oh, and that, wow. That's a shocker. Right. And, you know, it was like one of those things where it was like, well, the pastor has his problems. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, and then you start hearing the conversations that are all based on like classism and racism and misogyny. Mm -hmm. And when you really start putting those things together, you realize that their support of Donald Trump is not that surprising at all. Hey, all there is so much crazy info in this interview. I didn't want to cut Jared off. So we kept going and we're going to cut it in half. Part two of this interview will air on ne next week's show. Until then... If you want to find Jared, he does long and fascinating Twitter threads about a, lo a lot of the subjects we discussed today at J.Y. Sexton, S-E-X-T-O-N. Uh, he has his own excellent podcast called The Muckrake, which I highly recommend. And uh, he, bl he blogs at themuckrake.com. If you would like to pre-order his book, it's called American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. Tune in again next week for the rest of the interview. <laughs> Well, friends, that's it for this week's show. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, howto at howtoheretic.com. Or uh, if you are the president of the Confederacy, you can leave us a voicemail about it at 903-88-HOW-TO, which is 903-884-6986. Uh, you can also fire the first shot at Fort Sumter, at me, at Twitter. I am at howtoheretic. And thanks to our patrons, especially the ones who find my voice orgasmic. <laughs> and thanks to Cody Layton for editing the show. And thank you, dear friends, for tuning in. Bye. Bye, friends. Bye.